Old Nose Talks. Today we have Kyle and Vanessa Jankowski, and they're speakers for the Summer APTI Conference, and the topic is Personalities and Relationship. I'll also be speaking there too, and I'll have the information linked below for people who are curious. And Vanessa, I'd like to pass things over to you to tell people a little bit about this conference. Sure. We're looking forward to it, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your talk as well, Joyce. Kyle and I will be presenting on being able to appreciate your partner's differences instead of just clashing and how to really communicate with your partner better through understanding type. And it's something that we found a lot of um, importance to bring into clinical work when we're doing couples work or group work and being able to understand people who have your different type and then, you know, relationships and families and even in your work uh, communities. So when we'll get into a little bit more about what we'll be presenting on, but some of the theory and ways that we have found really helpful for our clients and people we work with and the programs we run is uh, been discovered through our own working together over the years. And um, so today we figured we'd talk about our discovery of how type has really helped our communication and our working together and really facilitated both of our growths individually and together. Excellent. And so Kyle is an INTJ and Vanessa is an ESTP for context. Before we dive into today's topic, how these two types get along and how they work together, how they function together in a relationship, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your type background. So uh, Kyle and I are both uh, co-founders of the Center for Change and Healing, our clinical uh, practice, and we expanded a couple of years ago into adding a pediatric component uh, named the Birch Forest Children's Therapy Center. And so a lot of the work that we got into with typology had to do with being clinicians. Uh, we're both masters in clinical social work and uh, scholars in both psychology and social work and uh, archetypal pedagogy. And so when we were um, starting up the practice and then working with people, we were trained in a Jungian clinical therapy model that involved looking at typology, but through the pairs of thinking and feeling, sensing, intuiting, extrovert, introvert, and then working to bring people into balance through being able to balance those pairs, you know, knowing which one you typically are and then finding more ways into the other. And as we did that, um, we ran that and worked that into our workshops and into our clinical practice in general. So that's how it, it had started for us. And then uh, we went into our second master's uh, in depth psychology that we both hold. And we did a typology course with Carol Shoemate, where she trained us in the John Beebe's eight function model. And so that just lit everything up in a whole different dimension, having such nuances and really understanding then how the type codes work as a uh, overall preference, um, such as the ESTP and INTJ is not just the eight functions, but as a whole, what that personality preference is like. Um, so we brought that more into our clinical practice. We had a um, typologist, Mark Grandstaff, who was a Brigham Young University professor for many years, come and run a typology program for our clinic. And he had us co-present with that. And then a lot of the people in our practice ended up having um, their types assessed as well. So then we were all running about six, seven groups a week at that point. And so then the people would have their types and then other people in the groups want to know their types and then they would get typed. And so we ended up having in our individual and group um, practice, having a lot of typology starting to occur. Uh, Kevin Kell is one of our uh, pillars of this of our clinic, and he's also a typologist. And so when he, we're having executive conversations and talking about a lot of these things, he helps bring in the type conversation as well. So we then continued into a post-master's training with Carol Shoemate about how to do type assessments and to provide those and help people and to evaluate that, to help them have the opportunity to discover their preferences for themselves. And... Um, then we got to be able to provide some trainings at some think tanks, some three-day, two-day programs about how to really understand the eightfold function. Um, and then we were invited by BAPT to come and present on relationships and typology. And so that was a really neat honor that has led us here today. Cool. Yeah. You can see the love of type and the love of Jungian psychology that has led you up to this moment. So 
that's hecka awesome. Yeah, I don't think either one of us really set out to do typology, but there just kept being really neat opportunities and awesome people. And then it really was an exciting area to, to study and get better in. So uh, it's just been an unfolding path. We've done a lot with our practice uh, since the beginning with archetypal narrative and uh, story making as part of trauma focused therapy and mm -hmm. people kind of archetypally mapping out their life history and psychodrama and um, psychodynamic issues and things like that and trying to make it into a less jargony type of um, you know, conceptualization, understanding of, you know, what's led them to the place where they've come into therapy and have it be something that's a little more personal, a little more humanistic. And we found that a lot of the language of depth psychology and archetypal psychology naturally lends itself to that, um, not just in the story making and kind of, you know, classical fairy tale way, but also BB's type model with having the archetypes associated with each of the eight functions I mean, at least for myself, I felt like that was a natural extension of what we were already doing. So that that generated a lot of excitement to take a deep dive into seriously studying typology again. Also, what Kyle's saying about with the trauma is people have found it really healing to find what their type is and helps them sort out what is issues and trauma and complexes versus what's their natural way of being. And so that's something we've also seen really helpful with people. Yeah, so I might invite you both on another time to talk about archetypes and how you can use that in your own personal development and growth. So I oh, would love that. <laughs> cool. And so we're here today to talk about the ESTP and INTJ dynamic. You guys have worked together, built a couple of businesses, and been through two master's programs at the same time and a variation of other events together too. And so I'm curious. How does this dynamic get along and what are your thoughts on it? Get along perfectly. No problems <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> it's been quite a learning journey. Do you, do you want to start? Sure. Okay. Um, well, one thing that was actually kind of interesting is I didn't know Kyle was an introvert for a long time, which is a, a problem that INFJs and INTJs run into before they tell other people um, or know themselves is that people think that they're an ambivert or an extrovert. And, um, and so that made some communication difficulties as uh, I being an extrovert. And so um, we found one of the things when we kind of finally discovered that that was one of the communication struggles was that introvert extrovert pairing. Um, it, it made a lot of sense that uh, he, so a common problem with obviously with introverts and extroverts, extrovert talks a lot, introvert doesn't, but um, that wasn't so much what we ran into. Like we ran into much more of the, um, I'd be very excited about something Kyle was sharing with me. So I would jump in and then he would feel interrupted. He would feel that I wasn't really listening. He'd be like, why aren't you listening to me? I'm like, but I am listening. This is, this is how I listen. I get excited and I share. And, um, and then on the flip side, I would be sharing um, a lot of different things as an extrovert might do before I get to where I really wanted to get to. And by the time I'd get there, he's like, hey, that's a lot. I'm just taking a lot in. I need to process it. And I'm like, but I just got to the main point. He's like, but I've been listening this whole way along. And I realized that I would expect him just to be like tossing off the fluff, you know, and the communication. And then until I got to the main point and he was really taking all of that in. And uh, so when we started to realize these dynamics that came across as initially that the other person didn't really care, wasn't really listening or wasn't getting us, that it was actually an introvert extrovert problem. We found some ways to, to work with that and started smoothing out some things. Another bias that I came into um, the relationship with um, from where I grew up and the, I grew up in a very different social class than we're in now and I'm one of, uh, there's not a lot of uh, educated people in my family or around in the community I grew up in. I grew up in a very blue collar manufacturing area. And so the social norms are completely different. So a, a person who, man or woman who would um, think out loud, like Vanessa's talking about and going through all the different ideas and details, they, they would not be somebody who would be uh, typically very intelligent um, or have 
wanting to actually make a point. They would be more someone just talking to hear themselves talk and more of a um, self-entertaining kind of narcissistic way. Um, so that was a bias I had to get over really early and realize, you know, how much I, I knew Vanessa was very intelligent, but I had to come into realizing that as she was saying, though the details along the way don't always matter. They matter more for her than they do for me in like some working out some type of um, dialectic exchange. Thank you for sharing that you both. And so I notice in this introvert and extrovert dynamic, sometimes the introvert can think that the extrovert is taking a lot of conversational space up. It's like, oh, you're telling me all the details or you need to talk to figure out your exact point. And in that space, those 10 minutes you took up, someone else could have also shared their thoughts too. So in, yeah. in a way like, an introvert is extremely sensitive to the amount of time that they take up in a conversational dynamic usually, unless they have autism or some other mitigating factor, which makes it harder right. to tell. Sometimes the extrovert thinks that they're helping by talking more because it seems like the room is quiet and it's not energetic. They're like, oh, the energy in the chat is starting to die. I need to help revive the energy by talking more so that we can have a funner time together. So it's almost like these two types have a different interpretation of how they're helping the conversation because the INTJ doesn't want to jump in and interrupt if they're in a very lively environment. Like, let's say th they're in a natural space where many people interrupt each other. The INTJ may never find a time to talk because everyone is interrupting each other and that's the social norm there. Joyce, can I jump in on something that you're talking about here with this? Um, Absolutely. Again, again, it relates to the last point I was making about um, and this is something we deal with a lot in our practice and that Carol Shoemate taught us a, a really, uh, really hammered home the importance of is before you're dealing with type assessment and really more closely working with your type preferences that you have to get through the different um, social and cultural biases, cultural conditioning, religious conditioning, different things to get down to that, that core personality. And so in a similar way, the the norms of the urban environment i grew up in and the the mixed cultural environment which was mostly african-american and latino with a minority of um european white american caucasian the cultural norms were that people would talk over each other in a competitive almost domineering sort of way of like who was going to have kind of the alpha upper hand of conversation who was going to get the last word in and it was a lot of a very power-based communication so when I came into university environments and people were actually speaking to dialogue, debate, add to, supplement, and like actually learn in the back and forth, it, it took me some time to learn that the cutting in was not someone's trying to literally dominate. I mean, there are people like that, of course, but the not everybody was trying to dominate the conversation or shut it down, but there was a collaborative experience going on, you know, in the best of ways in the classroom. And so that, I, I feel like people that come from that kind of environment also as introverts, you have to keep that in check and also kind of reset your expectations when you're in collegial or romantic or friendship relationships with really strong extroverts that do a lot of that extroverted um, thinking and do a lot of the, um, the more outward conversation like we're talking about. Absolutely. You bring a really valid point that someone needs to consider their culture when also determining their best fit type preferences. For instance, with Japanese culture, they have a very introverted culture. And so shopkeepers don't typically greet you. And so if you're in North America, you have people greeting you all the time. And it's a little bit of a culture shock where you're like, an extrovert in Japanese culture may look very introverted because of the culture they grew up in. It's rude to initiate conversation at certain points in that culture. And so there are so many different factors that can impact how a type shows up or how they interpret a person's actions. Yeah. So. Well, one of the things that we found was helpful, uh, or I found was helpful as an extrovert, was simply to um, pause before I jump in and then, you know, kind of reiterate what I'm hearing Kyle say. And uh, which almost felt a bit redundant to me. But as he put it, he goes, look, words are hard for me to articulate. They, they are valuable. And I've put them together for a reason. And 
And I found that that was a really good way to get me as an extrovert to slow down, to make sure I've got a, the, I've actually heard what he's saying. And um, that really helped the flow of the conversation. So, um, and I saw, I that was one of the things I teach a lot of the extrovert, introvert couple pairs or parent child pairs, you know, is like, that it's really important to recognize what the other person needs to feel heard and work that into. And when you did that, what that really helped me to do was not um, succumb to the bias that a lot of, of introverts will have where, and a lot of INTJs have especially, that when someone is um, speaking in this way, the extrovert is, that they're doing a throw everything at the wall approach versus seeing that there's a, there, there's an understanding that develops between uh, that we have developed and develops between people where you, you realize they are actually being as selective and intentional with their words and with their phrases, turns of phrase and their meaning as, um, as, as you're trying to be also as an introvert. And that, and that creates another whole level of mutual trust and respect, I feel like. Yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, one of the things, if you want us to jump into this, Joyce, is also like taking a look at the the dominant inferior uh, functions that we found was actually really important for how these types get along. Yeah. Yeah, we can definitely get into that. With the ESTP personality type, they have an extroverted perceiving function as their dominant function. And so this is prone to channel changing. And so sometimes they can change subject when maybe the INTJ is still on that certain subject. Because with, with introverted perceiving, with the INTJ's dominant function, they want to fully flesh out one topic before going on to the next one. Whereas the ESTP is like, if the extroverted perception notices something it wants to address at that moment, then it'll switch to that thing. And then it can cause the introvert to go like, did you really hear me? <laughs> or did you absorb what I had to say? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, and this is something I teach introverts in my practice is they do need to challenge. We do need to challenge ourselves to be able to hold more than one topic kind of out on the conversation table and learn to deal with that but that there is a limit that everybody has where it just becomes a massive confusion in, and um, it's not productive anymore what's what's going on in dialogue or uh, conflict resolution or even planning a vacation. Like there's just too many options out and you have to keep it simple. Well, even to that point, I mean, one of the things is um, uh, Kyle would actually say like, wait, where did you go? Like, I would think it was obvious where I jumped to. And he's like, I, I need, I need segue segments. Like you, you at least have to tell me we are leaving this conversation topic and moving into another. Yeah. And that was really helpful for you to jump in and do too. The way I understood it. And I think I had someone else explain it to me was that it was like reading someone, reading an essay by somebody and they have no like linking clauses. There's no transitional statements and it just like jumps like from topic to topic and you're like, wait, where, how did we get here from where we started? It doesn't make any sense. And I could slow down and then go back and reiterate how I got there and what I was thinking. But that's actually one of the ways that that's helped me develop. And that's what I think has been really beautiful about what I've discovered is when you're, you're paying attention to your relationships this way, and it doesn't matter if it's your, your spouse or your friends, you know, but like, they really help you be able to develop other potentially inferior functions or less developed functions, not like the inferior function, but like to, to put those links together, I'd have to slow down and really have an introverted view of like, wait, and consciously bring that online of what was really the impetus to jump here? What is the link? And then articulate that. And in doing so, it helped develop more of my introverted functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really good points about how the INTJ likes to know, well, what's the point of this jump? They want to know, okay, so you're moving to this for this reason. Okay, so that's how it, it's almost like I need to, I need to make sense of it before I can get on board. I just need to, to link it all together. Extroverts operate at, at a faster pace. It's like, okay, this, 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 this. Whereas introverts like to be more thorough with their thought process. So they're like, okay, I really need to be able to find the cohesive link behind everything here for Kyle. 
What are some other ways your dominant and inferior functions show up in your relationship together? So for Kyle, obviously, he's the introverted intuitive with extroverted sensing as his fourth, right? And then mine's extroverted sensing. And then my fourth is introverted intuition. So it's been really interesting that they're they're opposite of each other, right? Um, because when anyone's doing something that's in your fourth position, it has a certain numinosity to it, but you also feel a bit uh, in inadequate or inferior in response to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, but if you're paying attention to are and you see how the other person exhibits them it really allows you to help individuate and develop your inferior function and so um um one we found that with like working together so that introverted intuition really likes the specific images they uh it's that knowing without knowing that seemingly comes out of nowhere it it has the whole big context big picture versus the extroverted sensing is I, a lot of times it's very present moment. It's very adaptive. It's also, I found very creative um, because we, you know, we like colors, we like nuance, you know? Um, and so one of the things that we found in working together is that um, we, for example, one of the, uh, the, some of the stories are actually some of the exhibits that are best way of just demonstrating. So we had an open house for the Birch Forest uh, Children's Therapy Center and the Center for Change and Healing last fall. And uh, we had done a whole bunch of work. We did this really cool um, uh, way of presenting information that we do because it's a co-treatment model between occupational therapy, the, the mind, brain, body component, and then the mental health therapy. And we, we work together with that. So in trying to find a way to best exhibit that in the open house, we created a forest of trees with information on it that had both the developmental stages for um, the physical developmental stages as well as the mental de developmental stages and how to have the um, warning signs. And so we'd had all of this that we've been pouring our energy into. Um, and like, I think the, even the idea of how, presenting this in an interesting and ingenuitive way uh, came from Kyle. And, but I sat down and realized we had to do the food. And um, I was like, we'll just get it done. You know, we'll cater Panera, it'll be fine. And Kyle's like, absolutely not. <laughs> he's like, we are not, he's like, we will not do something boring, you know? And this is- I, a, we, I like Panera, we're not hating on Panera. No, we like Panera, no, we, we cater Panera on a decent basis. But it's like, there's been, it didn't match, it needed to match the creativity level, the imagination, the effort and the presentation that we had put into the brochures and marketing materials and the way that we had things constructed, the the um, staff that were doing the tour and the shtick, taking people around and showing them the different treatment modes and facilities. And the Children's Center has two gymnasiums in it. And, you know, it's like it's a very active space as well as a clinical space. And, you know, I was saying, like, we, we have to find something that fits in as cohesive because this is not going to it, this is going to be this weird outlier that's going to throw people off, you know, in this. Yeah. And this is the type of things that I really appreciate because I was just going into that extroverted sensing, adapting, get it done. Right. And Kyle brings in the, that introvert intuition, which is really sticking to the image that is, helps bring out the essential archetypal nature of whatever we're working on. So we sat down and we, we've discovered that we design spaces this way. Um, and um, our home we've designed this is like, so we, we know that we collaborate really well and, and come up with something better than either one of us could done by ourselves. So we got to talking about what is the theme? What is the essence? And of course it was like the forest, right? So um, Kyle then was like, okay, so what, what can we do with that? And so then I bring in my adaptability and thinking about it. And well, long story short, what we came up with was we decorated the, um, the food table area with like greenery and and leaves and artistic leaves and we put, did this whole salad spread that looked like you were eating the leaves of the forest because I put them in clear glass cups and we had like the the salad dressing on the side and it ended up being this like beautiful display um to the point that it got people's attention but not to the excess that it becomes some type of you know weird you know art student project and bourgeoisie and unrelatable to the everyday people that are coming into our clinic. 
Yeah, it was really cute. Like Kyle went and got some fruit. We have like this table that has like a, a tree down beneath it because our, our logo has is a tree as well. And and he put the fruit on the top of the table. So it looked like you're picking the fruit from like the tree. And everyone who came in were people who've been to lots of different open houses. It's the people that come from different organizations and hospitals and clinics. So they, they go to these a lot, right? And so they were just like, wow, that's so interesting. That's so innovative. This is so neat. And they were like taking pictures and be like, oh, I want to do more of this and and being inspiring for other people to bring out their creativity and find ways to express that is something we both we get a lot of joy out of. So that that's it, it can create conflict that you know the introvert intuition, extrovert sensing, because they're almost diametrically opposed in some ways. Like I want to move, he wants to say put. But when we understood what, when we understand what's taking place and like in us working together with that, that's when like, it just brings out this transcendent uh, component we never would be able to find by ourselves. Yeah, it sounds like you were able to create a theme night where everything was sticking to the archetypical essence of what you guys were trying to convey. And it was done so in a way where you guys made it elegant and not gimmicky. So. It was something transcendent that you both created together that you both alone wouldn't have been able to do. It's almost like the, the merging of two different personalities can bring together such a, a beautiful outcome here. And so- Well said. I'm curious, Vanessa, you brought up before how the TE and TI dynamic can have communication differences in that the TI user is way more contextual with their logic and way more flexible or it depends with its logic. Mm -hmm. Whereas the TE user is more black or white with the certain categorical logical statements that it'll say. So I'm curious about how that plays out in your relationship and if you could go into that. So the funny story is we became aware of our TI, TE conflicts because of, of Kevin Kell. So uh, cause we were all having an executive meeting and we were problem solving. So we both went to our, our second function, you know, our parenting function and BB's model, or like, how do you manage a situation? And I start talking out of my TI and Kyle starts talking out of his TE. And there was, you know, like, wait, I don't understand. Like, well, that's not quite accurate. And, and Kevin goes, uh, Oh, I see what's happening. This is a TETI conflict. And he goes, Vanessa, you say more TI stuff. And then Kyle, he goes, you're going to say something T T E and then Vanessa, you're going to try really hard not to, but then you're going to say more T I like it's going to help, but it just makes things worse because you're not talking the same way to each other at all. And, and I realized he was right. And it was so funny because in trying to breathe through the T I and switch out of it or to understand what Kyle is saying, all I wanted to do was share more contextual information. It depends. And I, and, it was just such a funny moment of realization. And then when I was doing research for the relationship and um, uh, typology presentation with the San Francisco Bay Area, I came across um, a quote from Jung where he says, where TI and TE get together, there's always conflict, uh, even like war, he said, you know, it's just, it's like uh, uh, just a, a chemical equation that causes friction. Because and partly where it's in, in our functions, it gets even worse in our relationship because our whatever's in your second is also in your sixth or the opposite, you know, a attitude is in your sixth position. And that's the Senex or witch, which I really just gonna say that. Yeah. shuts everything down. You want to talk a little about that? Yeah, not to make it more complicated, but it it's really similar for anyone who's familiar with James Hillman's work with the Senex and Pure dynamic or the 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 elder and the youth conflict you know where you have generational conflicts or as some would say you know the midwest the american midwest is the uh the elder or the curmudgeon and san francisco or la is you know where it's happening and it's the and it's the newest and the best right now you know to the to the point that films like uh zoolander you know parodies that that the, they're talking about the models and they're right now, they're so hot. Oh my gosh. And that the, the newness is taken to an, a level of parody and absurdity, just like curmudgeonism and backwardness and being uh, trenchantly stuck in the past and in uh, decayed tradition is, has this deadening effect. 
and we obviously see a lot of this in um american culture today with these you know big generational differences and um philosophical different splits and politically um yeah i mean it, james it, hillman says like in order for our country to really the what modern western world to evolve we've got to address the puer senex split and when they're split off the worst of them comes out and when you bring them together the best of them come out and uh he said you could even see it in the um way we house children and elders because throughout history they were together and the elders would provide their wisdom and teachings to the youth and the youth would help them physically and then the people of the middle ages would go out and run uh society but instead we like broke them and now we just use the people in the middle of the society to um care for both instead of being able to bring out the best of both and yeah. so it's an anti-integration model right so with the sun x um typically we experience that six and that sun x is just completely shut down backwards you don't get me in the same way that the youth i hear kyle saying like mm -hmm. you know feels about like some of the older generations not getting them you know kind of idea one of the things we found our way through this conflict of ti and te is one understanding what the other function is right so really understanding what is the te um i personally was like he's helping this is helping he cares he is trying he's helping i was like okay so if it's helping oh i get it and that would help get me out of my own kind of complex around it and being like oh he's saying that this information is really needed in order for this to move forward oh that makes a lot of sense so it just took a lot of detachment coming up and out of like the way I would just feel automatically. It, it's, it takes a lot of, and we teach this to basically moving beyond the, the adolescent perspective in regards to like a self psychology way of thinking about it, or the, these are my, the, 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 like almost exclusively subjective, my feelings, my opinion, my values, my, my, this, my preference to, what's actually going to be productive, not with ignoring that, but like what is going to be productive to move the relationship forward? What is going to actually lead to leveling up the relationship? What's going to lead to a new understanding or a deepening of each other? How is it going to enhance other feelings and other values that you have that relates to, you know, each other? It, like you can't just stay in, you know, this is, how I feel is how I think about it and my preference. And you can't be in a relationship that way. I mean, it's your, it, it's, it's like, it doesn't matter after a point. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it helps that, I mean, that's where it's so important to know your partner or your friend or whoever you're relating to and realize and to trust them, right? You have to start with the giving them the benefit of the doubt and then really moving from there. And it's like, we've been through so many things and we've, and, some of these discoveries were made through conflicts where we eventually got to at the end. Yeah. Oh, that's what you were saying this whole time. I didn't understand. Yeah. Well said, well said. And so with TE and TI, a point that I noticed it in your storytelling from before is you talked about Panera bread and Kyle was like, no, Panera bread, that, that does not fit the theme. And there is a bit of with uh, the TE FI axis, uh, a desire for creative control. Like with his introverted intuition, he sees the archetypical essence of what something could be, but it's the extroverted thinking that wants to logically order the environment to reach that thematic element of the night. It's like the, the TE can be very certain of that is that is not fit or that does. If there's that categorical yes or no. Yeah, that that's something that I think, again, going back to a theme we've talked about before with move detaching from the biases and the cultural preferences and different things not not ignoring them and not disregarding them but being very aware of how do they influence things i grew up in a very practical environment to an excessive degree um which is common for any kind of working class community and a community that's very impoverished i come from i'm a third generation uh polish and um scottish on my other side of the family so um scottish side of my family's been here since before the revolution the polish family came much later but very very practical people everybody in my family are trades folk and um small businesses and whatnot so that was very much hammered into me of the way to do things 
even if it wasn't actually the best way to do things, but that there is one. But you're not actually, you know, just also be clear. And that was something I had to learn is, is it may come across as like a nope, <laughs> but it's not a, you know, at no point has Kyle ever been like, this is what we're doing. You know, I mean, unless there's something dangerous unfolding in a situation. And so, but that's how that, that clarity and that certainty could be experienced as a shutting down other ideas, right. but it's really just part of the dialogue. It's part of the dialogue and it's part of noting that it's, it exists, you know, as, as the younger people would say, it's a thing. Okay. <laughs> And because it is, I'm, I'm saying the phenomenon of it exists. I'm saying categorically it exists and that it should be considered. I'm not saying it's like, you know, fundamentally, this is it. End of discussion, game over kind of authoritarian approach. Yeah. I, I just don't, I, I think that that's, people can get stuck in that. But when I see my clients get stuck in that, they also tend to have a lot of OCD tendencies they have a lot of other types of control issues socially or within themselves. They might have addiction problems that co-occurs with that. So it's it's already, there's already kind of like an infection in their personality that makes them much more rigid than it is necessary to be able to stay in dialogue. Absolutely, yeah. So rigidness can be coming from other factors too. With extroverted thinking, what I'm trying to convey is it does have a sense of surety in how it speaks, even if it's not it's not trying to make you feel like that's the only option. It's just that at that moment, extroverted thinking likes to assert that at the moment, that is the best categorical information they know to make a decision right now. <laughs> and there is a sense of uh, authority it speaks with by accident. It's just like something that is contained in the voice. Yes. And I, I think what's beneficial and that I, that I try to practice myself is to teach people that, that basically what you just said, like, this is how it sounds. This is how it looks. This is probably how another person will experience it and clarifying. This is the best I have right now. It doesn't mean I'm not open to further discussion. Give me some more information. Let's talk it out some more. I, you know, change my mind, but this is I, like my, my clarity is really sharp. Boom. Right now at this moment, but it's not the end of the discussion, making that very overt to a team you're working with and trying to be typologically aware, a group environment, your partner, whatnot. I think it goes a long way because they hear, okay, you've done your job. And now we can also have a more of a discussion with what you brought to the table. It's not, it's not a final gavel coming down. Makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> and so I'm curious, are there any other points in the relationship that you notice are an example of how the archetype of an INTJ and an archetype of an ESTP interact with one another? What parts of your interaction with one another do you believe is influenced by your type? I think some of the opportunities that we, we've experienced uh, have been kind of created by that uh, the different functions and types uh, together. I mean, this goes back actually to the extroverted sensing, introverted intuition pairing. Um, uh, Pacifica University, graduate universities, where we did uh, our second master's in depth psychology, and we'd go out a little bit early and we'd stay uh, near the ocean, do our reading, you know, catch up, you know. And uh, when we first got there, there was a, what looked to me, the like extroverted sensing visual a strange cloud on the horizon that wasn't moving. And then in the morning it was still there. And I was like, that's an Island. And I was like, there's, and this is something that Kyle has helped point out to me is the um, uh, extroverted sensing anthem is like, it'll be fine. And, <laughs> and uh, normally it is. And uh, also at the ESTP, it's like, and I found is there has to be a way it'll be fine. And there's a way. And so um, I had a, uh, that but the island was actually Santa Cruz Island in the Channel Islands down around Santa Barbara. And um, I looked around, how do you get out there? I can like do paddle out there. And anyway, there's this whole. Uh, um, yeah, her first idea was we're going to kayak yeah. out to the island. <laughs> Usually you take a ferry out there. <laughs> it's an hour long boat ride. So it's like, no, we're not kayaking. But we ended up going out there. We ended up sea kayaking out there at different points. And it was a place of a great joy, you know. Um, it's a big whale watching and kind of uh, birthing nursery area because of the 
the reef that's there and everything for people that don't know. And so Kyle will listen to my new ideas that I'll have like that with, and then he will point out um, where I might be um, too enthusiastic or in, I'm just stuck in the present moment in that I'm not thinking about everything else we have to do in context. And, or I, I think that's so all underestimate how long something will take or how much energy it'll be. And so he'll be like, okay, well we can go out there, but we'd have to move X, Y, and Z. And what about the reading we plan to do? And I was like, mm. right. I have to be the practicality buzzkill. <laughs> <laughs> so normally we can make it work, but equally so on the flip side, we were going out on a different trip out there and uh when we're going to be sea kayaking as we were packing here in chicago he's like hey i'm gonna bring mint tea and i was like i've learned to pay attention to this from these type of experiences he'll just say these things and I'm like that makes no sense but i've learned not to like shut that down as on like and be like no you don't need that right i'll just be like okay and i watch right well, long story short, within 24 hours, we got out there. I'd eaten an airport salad that gave me some, like, the worst pain in my stomach. I I couldn't stand. It was like fire. And the only thing that could make it better was the green, was the mint tea he had brought. <laughs> and if he hadn't brought that mint tea and if I had shut it down and being like, ah, it doesn't make any sense, that um, I wouldn't have had what I needed for us to go out and do the sea kayaking the next day. Yeah, but, so, that's, yeah. but that's introverted intuition. It's just a weird thing. The phenom even for those of us that it's in our our top three functions, it's just bizarre. You know, it just it doesn't give you any context. It just is like you have to do this. You know, it's like okay. What I what how I've learned to trust it. Uh, again, coming from a a cultural background and a socioeconomic background that where intuition doesn't even exist as a human function at all. It's, it's considered uh, insanity or witchcraft or a, not even a thing. Okay. The sensate world where I, is, is, is all the functions don't exist except for set, uh, the sensate world where I grew up. So, but it's you, what I've learned is by not listening to it and not heeding its advice in a sense, things go badly. And that's kind of how I learned to like, okay, this is, this is a real thing to learn to work with this. What does it mean? But that I'm not, not going to get very much from it. As far as like the, the whole type preference, you know, it, it would be, these are the stories I, I, I thought there was not really a good way to break them down past the whole type code. So um, the pandemic hit, uh, I'm working on my dissertation, finishing up my PhD and um, as the pandemic hit, where I did my best work was out at Pacifica in that whole holding environment. And um, there was no more could we go out there. And I was like, how am I going to get my dissertation work done now? And it was like right at the beginning of having to write the most creative works, which was also not my top preference to be a writer either. And so, oh. um, uh, and I was kind of stressed about this. And Kyle, it's like, well, we'll turn your study into a better archetypal holding container. And right around then, Pier 1 was going out of, of uh, um, having their stores and reducing size. So they had all these sales. So, and uh, I ended up painting the study like the color of that ocean blue that was out near the Santa Cruz Island. And, um, and he brought, he helped me find like all sorts of different, really interesting, creative, like, pieces to bring into my study to really evoke that type of depth psychology, scholarly work that really helped me be able to do the work that I'm doing as the place of which I work. So and, and moving things from our office here and from around our home and bringing them into the space to, because it, it, I was hearing, I was intuiting, but I was also hearing and remembering things that really spark you, you know, into creativity and like really activated that um th that would be what the, th the third function yeah we're doing that mm -hmm. yeah really like activated and sparked that which you weren't necessarily aware of and i would introduce and you go oh wow that's the perfect thing oh wow that's exactly it oh wow that's thematically on point well and that's what i was going to say is the intj with that introverted feeling the third there you are are highly sensitive like and highly like caring like deeply deeply caring and that often very quickly gets missed but like kyle will just tune into like what's needed what i need really work to nurture and feed that in that way and so um 
the other one I was going to say is, is Kyle, instead of going on for his, um, PA for his doctorate really took time is doing poetry and po poetry publishing and, um, really developing that. And like me, uh, I was thinking about the story in Yosemite where you were, I've learned that in paying mm -hmm. attention to how he really gets his poems, it really depends on where he's at and wherever he's at, he's got to stop and start writing down the beginning of the poem and you can edit it later, but if he moves, he loses it. So I don't know if you want to tell that one. Um, we were near Klingman stone. Half dome. Half dome. We were, we were on, uh, in that part of the park and we were walking along some trail that was following, I think the river or one of the big creeks over there. I can't remember which one it is. And I had this impulse. I had to go out into and sit down. I'm going to read. Okay. I'm going to do some reading. Okay. And then it's like the, the intuitions is, you know, there's something to write. Okay. Get the notebook out, get the pen out, you know, I'm looking around. So I usually get called to a specific place or, and it's the middle of the river. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to stand in the middle of the river and write. <laughs> really it's the middle of the river okay so i you know get rid of my shoes my boots and like you know roll my pants up and go out there you know and then just boom it's like a download and so what i found is like that meanwhile she's like why are you standing in the middle of the river he's like writing know? a poem i'm like oh i get it right like that's what he has to do and he communicated that to me but it's like these experiences that we'd go out into like uh, arches and canyons national park and you know somebody like i use my, my estp self like i ran uh when i was younger led outdoor adventure programming and all that is that i help set up these experiences like making sure we have the right gear and um we have the right conditioning we'll like you know do a whole conditioning series before we go that creates these opportunities and then also staying out of the way and being supportive of that so that these like poems can then and they're they're yeah. beautiful i mean i love listening to the poems that he's written that we were like i was a, a part of because i feel more drawn into then the experience because it's that whole thing that i was missing out on right but her primary way of going through the experience is like we're gonna do an all-day hike through a part of the park or we're gonna go to this precipice somewhere or we're gonna go overland here and there and it's it's the the moving doing se adventure you know so it's it's learning and i really appreciate that you you see the value in it versus you know pausing from the from the like you know oh no we're not gonna we're not gonna be able to go do this we're not gonna meet the timetable or what this is gonna happen pausing so i can write at a moment mm -hmm. and that it isn't indulging me it isn't you know um it's supporting your creative process yeah. so you can be what you are. Yes. Yeah. So it seems like there are these periods of time, Kyle, where there is this inner knowing that tells you to do certain things like the being in the, the water and then it'll, it'll, it'll generate some sort of creative inspiration or it'll be the right place and moment to trigger creativity from you. And you just know. Yes. And so it seems like your NI just knows where to go for that creative inspiration and you don't know why you're there until you're there and then the poem is up and so i'm wondering if you could read us one of your poems actually to to give us a feel of your writing style and just what goes on in your mind sure i'd be happy to do that uh there's one that comes to mind that i wrote when we were out in arches national park and in canyonlands and the um the landscape there is where it gets its name from. There's all these natural sandstone bridge arches out there and keyholes in the mountains and whatnot. And a, a number of them are really impressive, especially when the sun or the moon is coming through at specific angles and the way that it lights up the rocks. And some of it reminded me of uh, the old stained glass windows in churches. And I have a Catholic background um, from growing up. And so there's a lot of um, my, my religious and spiritual practice are, this is, are woven in with that and in that foundation. So there's uh, allusions to and references to um, orthodoxy and uh, Roman Catholicism and uh, different uh, indigenous traditions and whatnot 
that are also uh, part of that in the imagery. And you'll see that in this. This is called Through These Earthen Cathedral Arches. Through these earthen cathedral arches, I see the people and epochs that have stained the glass of the stations of the cross. My life. I see our trials inked in fractal colors on the sandstone, woven together with lead yarn, as we each seek the mystery of inner gold. The Black Madonna of Utah is red. She is each butte, a sentinel in the desert. Like people of the Lady of Mount Carmel, I seek the wilderness to delve into the secrets of the human heart. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Powerful, poignant. And so before we wrap up the interview, I'm wondering if you have one more INTJ and ESTP story or exemplar or anything you'd like to share about your relationship before we close. Well, I don't know how much it has to do fully just with our relationship, but we, we both have a deep care about what's happening in the world. Um, and we both have always had a drive and a call to like work to, to help in any ways that we think we can. And so like, um, as I was saying, you know, Kyle's like really supportive of my dissertation that has to do with a lot of that work about the changing evolution of human consciousness and how that can help give us context for all those things. Um, which is me basically also me geeking out with my TI and, uh, I will run down and be like, Kyle, Kyle. And then I pause. And I go, <laughs> I have a new theory. Are you in this space where you can hear it? Because if I just start going into archetypal theory, he starts listening and it'll just drag him right into it. And um, that's not always the space he really wants to go in or how he's going to be best supportive. So no. I've learned to ask, are you in the space to hear it? You know, and equally so like uh, with what's happening in the world, Kyle's incredibly tuned in to um world events so when the ukraine uh russia war conflict has started it was actually on on my birthday. birthday um he uh was just really pulled into that and you know he, he grew up around ukrainians and obviously being polish and and it it was just something that uh really spoke to him and uh me being and us being in this kind of dialogue and him communicating that it really led to him writing the ukrainian uh, poetry book that he's like a, he mentioned was, was in process of publishing and um, really working to do. We did a fundraiser for uh, Ukraine as an art fundraiser that was mixed in with our holiday party. And there's just been, you know, so watching each other's um, process of our hearts really being pulled into things and then how we do that in a ESTP or an INTJ way. Um, and, and being able to know that that's not necessarily how the other one would do it, but that it's equally valuable and important has been uh, critical in, in our relationship. Yeah. Um, i trying to think if there's something else I can add to that. And it's okay if there isn't too. <laughs> well, as you know, he, um, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be quiet. Not help, like an extra will help. I mean, I can probably come up with another one. I just, it, it work, I work best in interviews when there's a, uh, you know, talk about this. Oh, I got one other one. You know? Well, that exactly that. I mean, one of the ways that we work together is that I will come up with an idea, something will spark some program, and then um, I'll come to you with that. And it really sparks your intuition. You start to really come in and provide things. Yes. Yeah flesh out the themes and the form and you know it's it, the prep the practicality comes in of okay so what is this going to actually look like and how do we do this and what's the format of the program we're going to do and i had to learn that that wasn't criticism on what i was presenting and then when i would listen to what you were saying about the ideas or like have you thought about it this way or have you thought about bringing these other components that um it really would bring out what I was trying to get at even more so. And that creative dialogue mm -hmm. has, I mean, that's how we've worked to create programs, uh, companies uh, really furthered both of our um, individual endeavors 
you know? So even if he doesn't understand the theory that I'm working on, or I don't understand like, you know, where he's going per se with some poetry at a particular poem yeah. that we can listen and still be able to provide the support the other one might need. And this is actually another example of what we were referencing earlier with people have to move out of the adolescent position mm. and orientation and not have so much ego. Um, it, it's it, like in what Vanessa's saying, it's not shutting down the other person's ideas. It's refining them. It's trying to bring out the best of and enhance what's already um, a very, a very healthy seed of idea, inspiration, or information. Absolutely. And so I even noticed that in this conversation here, Vanessa will start off talking, and then Kyle will add on to and flesh out more fully the topic that Vanessa brings up. So it's almost like Vanessa is able to ignite it. And then Kyle is able to structure what is being said. So thank you for coming out today and, and sharing about this ESTP and INTJ dynamic. If you enjoyed this interview, feel free to check out the APTI conference linked below. As you can see, when two types who value different cognitive preferences meet together, you're able to have a dynamic duo and a, and a team that is very much unrivaled. And uh, there will be mint tea when you need it. And you will just be told by the universe or the archetypes or, or a great knowing that that is needed. So thank you for the poems, the stories, the adventure that Vanessa brings. And yeah, this was a good chat. Thank you, Joyce. This has been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And so that's a wrap. Thanks for watching Type Talks. My name is Joyce May, and I'll see you all in the next episode. Thank you.